Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Woodburn Accountants and Advisors webinar series. Woodburn is proud to be hosting its first webinar series in 2019 on the complexities of a finding and employing individuals in China. Are you planning on recruiting staff in China? Are you having existing turnover issues of your key employees within your organization? Do you understand the legal implications of hiring individuals in China? Together with Manfred from Steinkellner China Search, a professional recruitment firm, both Woodburn and Steinkellner will provide you with information and tools on the HR issues which truly impact organizations in China. Before we begin today's presentation, however, I would just like to go through a couple of administration points. The first is, and I've been having exactly this problem today, you may or you may not have to use a VPN. Um, in my case, the system kept kicking me out when I was using my VPN, so I am not using a VPN today. Um, uh, just be weary. Um, if you are being kicked out of the system, it may be because of your VPN. Uh, you may want to switch that off, turn that off, depending on what situation you're in. If we do run into any technical difficulties, because Manfred also ran into some, some issues, don't exit the webinar. It usually takes about 30 seconds at most, up to one minute, for the system to reboot, and then um, we will continue with the presentation. Please remember that we are recording this webinar, so it will be posted, um, uh, it will upload it onto Woodburn's YouTube channel, um, and you can always look at it again at a later date. Now, once you've launched into the GoToWebinar system, you will be prompted to choose your audio option. Uh, by default, it will be the mic and speakers of your computer. However, if you're having problems with the internet stability or just generally the line and communication, then you can switch to a landline or, or mobile phone and you'll get a dial-in number, access code, and audio pin. Please don't be shy. We will have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation um, of around 10 to 15 minutes. If we don't get to your, your questions today, Manfred will be answering them at a later date. Um, we are hoping by the end of this week with doing four webinars in a week, there is a lot of admin work. And today, particularly, we've had a lot of technical issues. So please bear with us. We will get to you as soon as possible, but don't be shy. You know, these webinars are complimentary, and we're happy to give you guys some free advice um, if, if you have any questions that arise. So in order to test the system and to make sure that you're all able to hear me, it would be wonderful if you could click on the hand button that is in your control panel. That will allow me to know that you can hear me. If you could then unclick that hand button, um, that will allow me to know you're still listening. For those of you that have not been able to join us for the last two webinar sessions or also have not been um, ever heard of Woodburn, I just want to introduce who we are. Uh, Woodburn Accountants and Advisors is specialized in inbound investment into China and Hong Kong. We establish, manage, and administer companies in both jurisdictions based on our client-specific requirements, which can be anything from market entry advisory, cross-border investment advisory, tax optimization, corporate restructuring, um, as well as just standard standalone company uh, administration. Um, our clients are focused on entry into the Asian region, specifically into these two markets, and they're doing a variety of things, everything from uh, producing in China, exporting from China, selling into China, offering a variety of uh, service-oriented um, uh, services in, in China as well. And they range from startups to multinationals and publicly listed companies. I am going to be your moderator today. So again, I didn't, uh, apologies, I didn't update the slide. I will be your moderator for today and will be uh, hosting the Q&A at the end of uh, Manfred's presentation. Um, a little bit about myself, I've been in the Chinese market since 2003, helping companies to invest into China and expand within China. Um, I just always want to reiterate here, you know, three things that I've learned uh, in my 16 years of, of doing business in China. Um, the first is I've learned a great deal of patience. Um, and I think any Westerner that's planning to enter the Chinese market or is already doing business in China has understood that you know, you have to be patient 
with doing business there. Even from a from a personal life perspective, you've got to be patient. Um, as part of the Chinese culture, I think the Chinese know really well how to uh, play off from uh, Westerners' lack of patience. Um, things will get done, but they will occur at the speed uh, that the Chinese want it to occur in. And that's just where you have to be patient. Um, the second thing that I've learned is really to have an eye on detail. And, and probably this is stems from the fact of, you know, I am in the accounting field and, and I have to look at the numbers carefully. But it also stems from the fact that every document you read, you need to be able to understand it. It needs to be translated either into your mother tongue or at least into English. And before you sign anything, read things two to three times. And just remember, there's no question that's a dumb question. If something sparks your interest, don't assume that it's just because it's China, it's written like that. Um, ask the question to your advisors uh, or to whomever you're working with, is this correct? Is this normal? Because I've never seen something like this before. Uh, most of the time when these questions arise, it is not the norm, which is why I say, you know, talk to people, go to your advisors and speak to them about, um, you know, what needs to be in a contract, uh, and, and make sure you do this before you sign any con sign any agreement. Um, the third thing I've learned is that in anybody's China journey, there are consistent obstacles that arise. Um, and I think the key thing to note is that there's always a loophole to the system in order to get by that obstacle. Um, first of all, you need patience, you need time to, to come around it. Um, but you know what a lot of Westerners do, it's just part of our way of doing things, is we tend to always look for the person to blame um, in reference to why did we reach this obstacle, why did you get us there, why didn't you do it another way. There's no right or wrong answer in that. I mean, things happen in China so unexpectedly um, that obstacles just come up and you have to figure out how to get around them. But I've seen so many companies and so many Westerners within these companies focus so much on blaming and then terminating staff so that there's such high, high turnover versus just trying to find a solution. Um, China is so fast-paced, it's such a fast-paced environment that in order to properly succeed and not lose time and be efficient, you know, you really have to think more about problem solving um, than you do about ha having to blame people. Um, so these are just like the top three things I've learned um, in terms of, of, of dealing with people as well as doing business in China. Um, the aim of these webinar sessions is really just to inspire, inform, and educate people on doing business. Um, and I'm very proud to have Manfred, uh, who's going to be speaking to us today about um, finding the right production manager for your production site in China. So Manfred, I'll, I'll lead it to you. Perfect. Thank you very much for your introduction, Christina. Um, this is Manfred, Manfred Stein Kellner. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, also from my side uh, to today's webinar. Before we're going into the topic, just two slides about what we do and a little bit about myself, uh, and then we'll get cracking. Um, so Steinkel and China Surge really is, is out there and exists to identify and attract the right leaders for your organization. Um, we do that with precision and we do it fast. Um, we're mainly dealing in, in, in two areas, so to speak, on one hand side, um, we help Europe-based companies to build up uh, their sales entities in China, and on the other hand side, um, also production entities. Because at the end of the day, uh, you need a good product and then uh, you need a strong sales force in order to sell it. Uh, if your production facility is producing uh, too many 40 products, uh, then things don't work out. And if your production is running really smoothly, but well, you can't sell it, then you've got an issue as well. So those are really essentially the two, two areas we're, uh, we're into and where we're quite strong. Um, in terms of clients, you know, it's, it's, it's very different. We've got um, small SMEs that are just starting out in the high-tech field in China with joint ventures. Uh, we've got also rather large organizations with uh, uh, many 10,000s of people who have already have a very large footprint in China. Um, and who would you know uh, like to find the next plant manager or the next uh, head of the organization? Apart from you know um, being quite active in the executive search field, um, we're trying to 
really accompany our clients uh, to the finishing line where, where they're achieving their business goals. And so every now and then that also takes, you know, recruiting a uh, head of quality or recruiting uh, operational salespeople. And so one of our business units is uh, exactly dealing with that. Next, please, Christina. Um, so, you know, Christina touched upon a little bit what we what we learned in our uh, journey and the paths that we've taken. Um, and I can completely sign up to what she said in terms of fast paced, in terms of cultural difference. For those of you who are uh, either Chinese uh, or for those of you who've already been, been dealing with China for a long time, you're very well aware of that. You're very well aware that the pace is a different one and that there needs to be a cultural gap. Uh, so this is also one of the things we'll be touching later on that, you know, um, don't lose too much time. Um, be, be, make sure that you're actually in, in, in touch with the candidates uh, that you're talking to, because if you're not, uh, the assumption on their side might be that you've actually lost interest and they'll simply turn to the next opportunity uh, and sign a contract there. Whereas maybe from a European perspective, you know, it simply, it simply took the time it took um, so really about myself, um, I've, I've started out in 2003 in China, in northeastern China, in Chijihar, uh, been pretty much in, in, in many smaller places in China, uh, and then only later on actually got into the hubs like, like Beijing and Shanghai. And one of the things that, that helps me really in uh, the, all the things that I did so far uh, was, you know, every now and then just switch to Chinese and go and talk with people and see where the problem actually is. Because at the end of the day, no matter where you go in this world, once you 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 manage to speak the local lingua, uh, then you'll always find a way to 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 get to people and to talk with them and also figure out what's actually going on and how to solve that. Um, you know, apart from that, I'm I'm very passionate about finding the right people for the right situations. I love doing that. I love uh, offering opportunities to people and also helping my clients to uh, reach the next level. All right. So with this one, the topic of today really is how to hire the right plant manager to ensure smooth production in China. Um, next one. <clears throat> uh, you know, when you talk about China quite often, uh, it, it, can, it can seem a little bit foggy. Um, and the basic idea for today really is to give you a couple of hints, to give you a couple of points uh, in order to, you know, uh, increase the sunshine, increase the clarity and to actually then understand easier how you can move ahead. Next slide. So after the next 30 to 45 minutes or so, um, I hope we can contribute a little bit to that goal. Um, and the agenda for today is looking like that, Christina. So splitting up in three parts. Um, I think when, when we're talking about production, you know, production can be so many things. Um, we can be talking about textile production, we can be talking about rubber production, we can be talking about producing uh, cups for takeaway coffee. It's very, very different. So first we need to understand what do we build? Um, also kind of the, the yearly quantities because that will mean very different uh, production systems in terms of uh, automation degree and things like that. And whom do we need for that? Uh, a plant manager is not a plant manager and we all know that. The second part is really, how do we find the right candidates? Uh, obviously, this is always a bit of a tricky one. Uh, and the next tricky one really is, especially if you're, if, you're, if you're starting up a factory, but also if you need to switch out of different reasons, is to get the timing right. Uh, because if you start up a new uh, factory and you get a perfect plant manager, uh, you just get him for, let's say, six to nine months too late. Uh, that is a real issue. So those are the three building blocks that I'll try to cover in my uh, presentation. And uh, with that one, let's move into the first one. So for example, this one here, you want to build a really fancy, a really modern, um, super uh, kind of state-of-the-art building. You know, if you want to do that in China, just from uh, 
construction material perspective and the quality you're expecting, uh, we're talking about a very different timeline than if you just, you know, move into a, a facility that you can actually lease and where you can start up right away. Next. So, you know, if you want to set up something new and maybe even build the factory, then you'll, you'll be running into a couple of challenges. Um, where do we start? Is it going to be 100% company owned or is it a joint venture with a Chinese company? Uh, which locations are we talking somewhere between Shanghai to Nanjing? Are we talking about northeastern China? Are we talking about western China somewhere in Sichuan? Um, these are all things that you need to cover. And then obviously you'll be looking at timelines, you'll be looking at uh, start of production, you'll be looking at how you find the right people about the overall budget. So there's quite a long list of, of, of questions that, you know, make a lot of sense to be answered. Next. So here's two examples uh, just to, to, to illustrate um, how different things actually can be. Um, one of our clients, they're producing, uh, they're producing seats. Essentially, they build seats for pretty much everything except airplanes. So if you're driving uh, a tractor or a bulldozer or a truck, uh, then chances are high, at least within Europe, that you're actually finding their seats there. Um, the second client I'm talking about is, is, is doing quite a different thing. Um, they're actually doing uh, production for the automotive industry as one of their business units. Um, and within that business unit, they're currently uh, talking with a, a major German automotive OEM uh, for producing switching forks for them. Um, and there we're talking about four million pieces. And you know, just simply from uh, the, the product that you have, uh, from the way it is produced and also from the pieces that actually need to be produced per year, uh, you get very different factories. And with getting very different factories, it also means that the top man uh, will need to have uh, a different perspective and most likely different experiences to run that smoothly. Um, just to paint a black and white picture, if you have a factory where you simply want to have 100 people in there uh, doing manual handling of whatever, that is very different as opposed to having a fully automated line producing 20 million pieces uh, for a common rail diesel injection system. Uh, next. So what we try really when we're looking at, um, you know, finding the right plant managers uh, instead of just just talking to everybody and saying, hey, you know, um, what are you doing in the next couple of months? Will you be interested in this opportunity? Uh, we take a little bit of a different route. We try to analyze a little bit and say, you know, what, what kind of technologies do we actually need in order to produce this? When we're talking about the seed, for example, it's going to be metal forming for all the basic structure underneath. So we have experience with that one. Then you move on to foaming, then you move on to injection molding and uh, in order to finish it at last, you've also got bits, bits of sewing involved. This would be the, the seat on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, now I didn't, I didn't, I don't have quite the right picture here. Um, it's actually looking a little bit different. And so you also need metal forming, you need laser welding, and you need injection molding. Yeah. Um, so this just shows you, you know, when you're looking for the right kind of person, uh, and I think most of us do that anyway, we, we, we're trying to put together something like a competency profile. Uh, and then with that, we actually go out and see who's got experiences in, in, in that field and who would actually be a capable person instead of just saying, well, you worked in my industry, uh, wouldn't you want to work for us and actually do that? Next. So let's look at those, those two things um, uh, separately. If we're talking about the, the plant manager for the seeds. Um, in both scenarios or in both uh, in both ways, or I think we're talking about setting up a new factory. You know, that could be the, the second, the third, the fourth factory in China, or it could be the first one. Obviously, if it's second or third, then you already have basic experience. You already have some structure in China, uh, and that will, you know, uh, allow you to do the, the necessary HR steps in an easier way. Or maybe there will not be so many questions and already certain learnings from the first facility. But let's you know, start where we start. Let's say this is the first production facility that you're building. 
Um, something that most of my clients actually want is to have uh, somebody with plant management experience. Um, you know, this is a very is a very distinct move, and you need to reflect a little bit about it. Do you want to have somebody who has the potential to be a good plant manager, or do you want to have somebody who has shown and proven that he's a good plant manager? Um, obviously, it will always, you know, uh, incur different costs. Somebody who's, let's say, 30, 35 ish and who's never done this job is going to be cheaper than somebody who's 45 ish and who's got 10 years of experience on that job. Um, but just, you know, get, get, get back clear in your head and also, you know, within your, your team, the, the group of people who decides on what do we need. Um, talk about that and reflect about that. Um, both, both ways are good. Just if you go with the unexperienced one, you need to put in more, more safety nets and probably also put in more support from headquarters. Um, always, 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 you'll need somebody with experience with European company. Later on, we'll talk about, um, is it preferable to have a Chinese plant manager or a European one? Um, no matter which option you go for, you really want to have somebody with experience with the European company. Um, otherwise, you'll end up investing a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of efforts simply, you know, uh, to, to align people and to ensure that you're, you're doing the things you do the way that needs to be done in your company and, and, and from a European perspective. Build up experience. Um, if you're setting up a new factory, um, you know, essentially it's not just about uh, having somebody who can uh, do serial production. It's also talking about, does this person have the experience of building it up? You know, especially if you have no structure in China, um, there'll be uh, work with authorities involved, uh, the whole HR matter, uh, where you'll need to recruit, depending on your facility, anything between uh, 20 to 100 or 200 people within the first couple of years. You know, it really helps if you have somebody who has experience with that, uh, as opposed to somebody who says, oh yeah, it's a challenge, um, I'll do it. This is very different. Uh, which brings me to proven track record. Um, you know, um, when you look at CVs, when you're doing interviews, you see and you notice if, if these people have been there and they've done that. Uh, we've touched upon this last uh, webinar. Um, also, do, do pay special attention when we're talking about uh, Chinese-only CVs uh, in terms of, you know, actually also ensuring that what's on the CV is also what's, you know, closely related to the truth. Um, if there's too much fantasy in the CV and if there's too much invention, uh, you'll want to figure that out in the, in the recruitment process and not when you've hired that person and when you're already uh, under, under time pressure. In terms of technology experience, I've talked about that before, um, you know, really try and understand what kind of production technologies do we have involved uh, and then match that with the experiences of, of the candidates. Um, that will also help you to get uh, much, much better fit candidates than just going for the, the job title and that's that. Um, and obviously, you know, what is always perfect if you manage to, to hire somebody who has already been producing that kind of product uh, when roughly your production parameters, uh, meaning also roughly the amount you're thinking about per year, or if you're talking multi-sites, whatever, um, that then is, is, is something that's coming close to a great or perfect fit. Next one. So if we're talking about the switching forks, you know, what really stays the same is you'll want to have build-up experience. Um, build-up experience, you know, there's also topics coming in afterwards. We're not just talking about the facility as such, about bringing in the, the, the production equipment. Um, we're also talking about sourcing. Uh, eventually, when you're going to China to produce in China, um, and let's say you're not just producing in China for the European market, because I think that that kind of business model is becoming actually less and less. Um, it's more, you know, you're in the Chinese market to produce for the Chinese market or to produce for Asia Pacific. Most likely, you'll 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 also want to set up a local supplier structure, um, and and people who have experience with that and who know how to, you know, tackle that. Uh, topic which can be a fairly big topic um, that will definitely help you and then in terms of uh, again technology experience if, if you really you are producing let's say 4 million pieces switch forks or 20 million pieces for a common rail injection system 
um, you know, the, the degree of automation is just much, 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 much bigger. Um, so these are kind of things you should you should really be be paying attention to uh, and and trying to figure out how well the people actually fit. Um, to kind of you know sum it up at this point, just be very 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 clear on what you need. No matter whether you are the COO or whether you are head of HR or head of international recruitment or whether you're an external recruiter, you know get a picture as clear as possible. At the beginning and and you know help your colleagues and your team to actually facilitate that picture because it most of the time it doesn't really help just to to go to four different stakeholders and let them say what they would like to have and then put all of them on the list and say this is what we're going for what matters is the picture that they have in their mind um and if you if you just let four people uh, write you an email on what they'd like to have then we're really talking about four different pictures um, and unless you're willing to hire four different plant managers, um, that's just, you know, really hard to do. Next. <clears throat> so talking about Chinese versus investors uh, versus Western plant managers, um, you know, this is, this is pretty much a strategy or philosophy question on, on how you want to do it. Um, the obvious things first, most of the Westerners don't speak Chinese. Um, we do have a fair share in our pool that actually does speak Chinese, but most of them don't. So this is obviously one of the things you'll, you'll, you know, you'll need to consider. Can he or she actually run the factory in China? However, those who've been there, uh, which is the, the middle column, Western plant managers with 10 years plus experience in China, um, you know, even if they don't speak, they've, they've found a system for themselves that works. Um, if you are thinking about, you know, taking some of your people here in Europe and transplant them to China to be the plant manager and run the show, you just need to understand that uh, these people have got no experience whatsoever in actually knowing how to run a plant in China as one thing. Second, they've got no experience in how to manage and organize the Chinese team. That's the next thing. And the third thing normally really is, is in terms of negotiation position. Um, you'll want them to move over. Most of the time, these people are going to be between, let's say, 30 to 50, which means many of them actually do have kids, which means many of their wives are not going to be very happy to actually be moving with the whole family to China, uh, which means your leverage isn't really too good. They're going to be asking for a lot. They're going to be most of the time quite unrealistic. Um, so what I see a lot is actually to kind of do it in a different way and say, look, we bring some of our production guys over there. Um, maybe he's a little bit younger. Maybe he's got not, he hasn't got family, uh, yet. Um, and that one is quite flexible and can, can, can move around easily. So you'll do that in order to bring in a uh, process and uh, production know-how that is specific to your company. And on top of that person, then you either put uh, a Westerner or a Chinese. Um, in terms of cost, it's quite a big difference between Chinese plant managers and Western plant managers, especially if we're talking about uh, Western plant managers kind of coming along with, with family and with kids. All these allowances, they can easily amount to 50,000 euros or even more, um, depending on, on, on the setup and what kind of you're, you're willing to pay. Um, obviously, for the Chinese plant managers, you know, they, they know their, uh, their culture um, much better. They know how to deal with their own people. So these are definitely uh, plus points that, that you have. And then, you know, you've got crossovers. You've got the maybe Chinese plant managers who've actually been studying at the German university, been educated in Germany and then working there for a couple of years. So something like this, you know, can, can sometimes be quite an interesting crossover. There you just need to be careful um, if they have no working experience in China and, and then are still in Germany and they want to transition back to, to China, you still need to be careful how, uh, how well they actually know how to run something in China. So they need to have working experience in China, otherwise um, they, they'll run into many, many, many issues that uh, will be difficult for them to handle with the Chinese only team. Next, Christina. So how to find the right candidates if you now are clear on, on what you'd like to have. 
and um, where where do you take them? Um, what we are aiming for really is, is you know very very simple explained. Um, if if we're hired as an external uh, provider, um, then what we start off with really is we 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 provide six great uh, profiles to start with. Um, then after initial filtering and maybe after initial um, video interviews, two of them drop out out of whatever reasons. Uh, then you're doing more personal interviews, the responsible people fly to China or you let those people fly in. Uh, and then after, you know, a serious interview process and a lot of personal get to know and introducing the right people, you get two great candidates that you'd both love to hire. Um, and then at the end of the day, obviously, you know, one great person uh, joins your team for the task at hand. Um, so this is kind of a very simple methodology that, that, that we're using and that we're uh, applying on a day-to-day -day basis. Next. You know, in terms of channels to, to find Mr. Wright, um, I think um, you can always and you should always start looking in your own organization first. Who is interested in international assignments? Um, that is something that obviously if somebody has been with your company for a long time, if he uh, knows the product, knows the production processes and wants to go over there in China uh, and, and, and doesn't have um, too high expectations, uh, then you know these, you should definitely, definitely consider these candidates. Apart from that, you know, um, go ask former colleagues. Um, all of you, if you're aware about it or not, have got a large network. Um, so approach people whom you've worked with in the past and see if they would actually be interested or if they would know people who would then be interested in this kind of job. The second thing, you know, is a very basic thing. It doesn't cost you a lot of money. You just need to think a little bit about it and then invite somebody for lunch, dinner or a beer. Um, and then you can ask them. Um, but obviously, if number one and number two kind of are not working out as planned, then you can still go and, and, and find people that you kind of don't know. And you can also use the Internet to do that. You can use WeChat, um, if you, uh, which essentially is the Chinese WhatsApp. Uh, in order to get in touch with people, you can use LinkedIn, you can use Xing, um, you know, whatever out there. You can also just post post job ads. Just always, you know, be careful about the location. Um, my personal experience is if you have people who are kind of based in Europe and you want to send them over there to China, um, it's going to be tricky with the timeline later on. And it's also going to be tricky with the cost range that you have uh, that you have set yourself. Next, um, also the question of doing it alone or getting support. Um, I guess it depends on a couple of issues. It really depends on how much time do you have. Do you have the internal resources? Have you already done it? Um, the people who are supposed to do it are they? Um, is this going to be a priority for them? Because if you if you are making an investment, let's say anywhere between uh, two million for kind of a, a leased facility and simply putting in certain machines, going up to 10, 15, 20, maybe 50 million uh, euros, then you know um, I think you, you'll want to have the right person, and I think you just you know need to look in the mirror and 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 ask kind of can my organization deliver that and if it can then perfect because you always know best what you're looking for uh, but if it can't then obviously you'll you'll need to be turning to an external provider uh, in order to uh, to find a solution for that next so you know um, how how to choose let's say fast forward let's say um four weeks after signing the deal you've got six great candidates in the inbox uh you're doing video interviews with them you meet them in person you're um, letting some people fly in you let all the key stakeholders meet them and so on and so forth and then you've got two two great candidates um how do you decide you know let's have a closer look at this one next please christina What normally happens is we're, 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 when we're defining, you know, what we're looking for with a client, what normally happens is we're, we're touching or, or using a lot of time spending on those three topics. Culture fits, salary, and, you know, is he or she competent enough to do the job? Next. Um, so competent enough in this case would mean, you know, 
already having a GM experience, already having that technological fit, that product fit, already been working in a, in a Chinese environment. This is kind of where that one's coming from. Next. Um, culture fit, you know, is very different if we're talking to, let's say, 200 people SME or 600 people SME, or if we're talking to 40,000 people, uh, rather bigger company. Um, there's very different cultures there in, in large organizations. You've got much more support structures. You've got much more processes uh, defined. Uh, whereas in small organizations, you tend to be much more hands-on. So this is something that uh, at most of the time we talk about and spend time on. Next, Christina. And then obviously, you know, clients always have a certain salary range, yeah? what, what they think um, and uh, what they would like to, to be spending on a certain road. Next. What happens then really is when we, uh, when it comes down to a final decision, what really, you know, plays an immense and important role really is chemistry. How did I feel about Jim? Um, how was I, I feeling about Junjie? You know, with Jim, I, I got along really well. We, 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 we hit it off. And uh, with Junjie, I wasn't sure about it. You know, these are then kind of things that, that we're all humans and we need to take that into account because all, uh, after all, the distance from Europe to China is, is many thousand kilometers, eight, nine, 10,000 kilometers. That is a huge difference. And even, you know, even with that, different, with that distance, it needs to work. So if we manage to find somebody whom, whom we've got chemistry with, uh, then obviously, you know, that is very important. And that is actually something that uh, really is hard to, to define when you set out for a project. But very, very often um, we bring in candidates who are competent, where there is a culture fit, where you can actually afford them. Um, but they, they don't get taken because, you know, the chemistry simply, simply isn't there. Um, me, myself, uh, I'm an Austrian. Uh, and it happens quite a lot when we bring in people from northern Germany. Uh, that my clients in Austria say, well, you know, it's chemistry just isn't there. Um, so I think this is something that uh, we need to take into account that we should respect um, because after all, you, you'll want to have a performing team and not just a team that is looking good on paper. Next. You can just go through these, Christina, to the next slide. <clears throat> mm. So how do we get the right person at the right time? Um, this is the final big question that I kind of want to pop and uh, also want to, um, to talk a little bit about with you. Um, so really what you see here is a kind of a, a, a short, short picture that I've drawn yesterday. Um, when we're going, when, when you're on, on the right bottom, you see start of work. This is the day when you, when you want to have that person. The first thing that you really need to be careful with is the notice period. Depending on whom you want to have, um, it can vary between one month in, in a you know, really perfect scenario and a lot of luck to actually six months. Um, I've got a lot of good candidates in the pipeline and in my pool um, who are on the job and when they want to get out of their job is six months per contract. Now, obviously, you know, you can find a solution that maybe it's going to be easier and they'll manage to get out by five months. But this will really depend on, on how do other organizations um, think about that? How do their bosses think about that? Do they've got the replacement in, in role? And very often, you know, now you say, well, you know, I'm, I might not be wanting the one who's needing six months. Obviously, I know you don't want to have that person. But, and, and this is an important but, uh, the people who are on a job, you know, they're good, they're strong, they've got a strong negotiation position. And very often in the interview processes, when you get to know them, you sense that. We, we don't want to work with people who are weak. We don't want to work with people who are in a weak position. And when we bring in people who, let's say, they've been on the street for the last three months because uh, they left their last job and didn't have the next job aligned, but they're super experienced, you know, these kind of things, they creep across when you actually get to meet them. Um, so, you know, really, really bear this in mind when you design the timeline of your recruitment process. Um, that you actually, you know, do calculate with the six months. If you find somebody 
who is on the job and uh, is, you know, is turning out to be faster than that, then, you know, there's two scenarios, really. Um, either he's just staying a little bit longer in the other job uh, until he can switch to you or what people, you know, tend to enjoy a lot as well is simply to take a month or two of vacation, go back home, visit family, uh, do another holiday trip that they wanted to plan anyway. And very often also, when, when we're talking about China, as Christina pointed out in the very beginning of the webinar, you know, things are changing. Uh, it might well be that, you know, whatever needs this person then actually to start earlier. Or could also be that whatever happens, it might mean that this person needs to start a little bit later. So this one was the first big thing here, the notice period that you're going to be. Notice periods with plant managers are quite, quite different from other roles. And the second thing really then is, you know, the search phase is such. Um, now in the search phase, no matter whether you're doing it internal or what you're doing external, um, you always need to know your own organization. How long does it actually take to? I've got clients um, from, from the operational side, uh, you know, within the organization, they had to wait between six to 12 months to actually get the headcount. Uh, and I'm not talking about the headcount for a new role, I'm talking about the headcount for an already existing role that had left. Um, so, you know, these, these things um, have an immense impact on uh, the timeline design of your uh, recruitment project. So I think, you know, it helps a lot to be, uh, again, honest to yourself and say, look, um, we're maybe not the fastest in terms of making decisions. So even after we have the people, after we met them, we still need, let's say, a month to actually then make a decision. And then you'll still need, let's say, two to four weeks um, to uh, figure out the details of the contract and so on and so forth. So all I'm saying really is just, you know, um, it pays off to spend a lot of time on the timeline design um, to figure out um, how this one should be looking like. And then also to think about contingencies. What happens if the first people that you bring up to, to top management or to your COO, uh, what happens if they got shot down? And then you bring in the next three people and then there's more question marks and then you redefine the profile that you actually need. Um, I, for myself, I, I, I enjoy you know, playing it safe. Uh, that means just essentially start as early as you can. Um, you'll have good candidates. Uh, it's always important that you're in a good negotiation position and uh, the more candidates you have, uh, the better your position is. But at a certain point of time, you just, you know, just like in project management, you need to make a decision. Um, you, can't, you can't hang in there forever. You can't just look at another six people and say, well, you know, it doesn't matter because sooner or later you need to start producing. And it does not make sense at all uh, if you want to ramp up your factory and you've got no plant manager there. Next. So just, you know, um, for example, here, uh, a, a, lucky, a lucky timeline of a project we did earlier. Um, client, we negotiated with the client, he signed a deal and we started in October 2017. Uh, then a month later, he had six high quality profiles. Then in December, he was already there to do interviews. Uh, in January, he partially met some people again in China, partially met some people in Austria. Um, then in February, uh, they did the fly-in, um, which is when, when they bring in the final two or three candidates to have a closer look at them and introduce them to all the key stakeholders. Um, and then soon after that, they made the decision and signed the contract. Uh, and then six months later, uh, in that case, a little bit more than six months because the candidate had six months notice period by the end of the quarter, um, that person started to work. Um, and this is like uh, an example timeline that you can, you know, kind of uh, take. So you see, we're talking uh, from, from start to actually start work. We're talking a year. If you're lucky, if you find somebody who's actually on the road, uh, then you can, you know, get somebody by, let's say, March or April. Uh, but there you need to be lucky. And again, you also need to then be wanting to work with that person who currently isn't in a, in a strong position. And uh, again, very often I find people don't want that. Next. <clears throat> so to sum things up here, really, do start the recruitment process early enough. Um, it makes things easier for you. It puts you in a stronger position. Uh, most likely, it will also 
put your overall costs down. Yeah? Um, in setting up a new plant, you have a hard timeline. Don't change your mind too often. You, you'll need to know your own organization to understand really, you know, how do we go about this? Um, be smart, factor that in. Um, and take the time early on to discuss different options. Um, you know, you, you don't always need to have live people. Obviously, that is always the best thing to do, uh, to, to get to get to know three people and then, you know, talk about them and the feelings you had. Uh, but you can also do that before and, you know, just put something together on, on, on Word files or go on LinkedIn and pull out some people and then ask your peers, you know, do we really want the young one or do we really want an experienced one or do we really want a Chinese one? Um, so I'm just saying certain things. You might not be able to clarify everything up front, but you'll at least be able to ask certain questions up front. Um, and last but not least, you know, whomever you're going to take on, somebody needs to build the bridge. Um, for those of you who've done it, you know it's an awful lot of work. For those of you who haven't done it, talk to somebody who's done it. It's an awful lot of work. Um, so when you're hiring, uh, make sure that this capacity is there because the last thing you want to have is to build a new factory in China um, and, and communication is really bad and things are going wrong left and right. Um, that's not the way to go. The way to go is to have somebody who can build a bridge, who's strong in communication, who will ensure that things are aligned, who will ensure that there's good and strong communication with headquarters. Um, and then, you know, you'll uh, in, a, in a couple of months or in a couple of years, um, you, you'll be where you, where you want to be. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Was it from my side, Christina? Thank you, Manfred. Um, let's go ahead with the Q and A. Um, Manfred, what is the trend that you're currently seeing in the market? Are people localizing these types of roles, or is there still a demand where people are hiring Westerners? Um, I think it really depends a little bit on the on the face. Uh, in, obviously, in general, everybody would be happy if the costs are lower, and the costs normally are lower with local roles. What I see with a lot of the companies that I've been with for a while is they start off with Westerners, then there comes a phase when they localize, um, and in many cases, the localization then is is creating troubles that are actually um, really hindering business and then they're going back to having Westerners. Um, so it's kind of, you know, is a, is a curve. It's an up and down and up and down. Um, this, is, this is what I see. Um, but especially with the smaller companies, it's, uh, it is more focus on having a Westerner in place. And with the bigger companies, the localization pressure is, is higher and is on. Why why do you say that once they they go from a westerner to a local person that is is it because there's not a good transition or is it because the rest of the staff are not feeling comfortable with a local person I mean what 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 would be the reason why that that sort of fails I mean just you know uh, very simply if you have um let's say you're a UK company um and you've got somebody um, from that, that region where your headquarters is based in the facility over there. Um, most of the time, you know, this person, he speaks your language. And I'm not just saying the language is in English. He, 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 you know, he knows where you're coming from. He knows how you're thinking. He knows what, what will be going on in your head. So this, this topic of, you know, how well connected are you to the headquarters in terms of knowing the right people there, in terms of really understanding them, uh, being able to show empathy for them. This is a huge, huge, huge thing. And what happens quite often is when, when, when a bigger company says, you know, um, we need to bring costs down and we just, you know, localize that, um, that is never really taken into account of. Uh, and then you bring on somebody, you don't focus a lot of uh, time and energy on onboarding. That person doesn't know the, the, the people. Um, and then, you know, there is... Uh, there is more and more uh, troubles kind of coming up. And this is where I see a lot. And obviously then also depending on what kind of, you know, as I said before, uh, you can't just, you know, uh, say that all 1.3 billion Chinese people are the same. Um, it's a huge difference if you have somebody who's never left China or if you have somebody who's been uh, kind of uh, 
working in international company for the last 20 years. But obviously, uh, the second one is going to be more expensive. And if it's just about, you know, bringing the costs down, then many will go for the cheaper option. And that cheaper option on the, on the mid and long run uh, will then actually create troubles uh, that far, far, far outweigh um, the costs that you have saved. So what, what, from your perspective, then, would be important for, for the onboarding process? I mean, what, what would you recommend companies do as a production manager is starting off with the company? Um, we're talking really about three things, and maybe the last one being the most critical one. Um, you need to, you know, in terms of technology and processes, there needs to be uh, a training. You know? Even if you've, you've uh, worked in a similar field, um, you still need to get to know exactly how these people are doing it. Um, that goes hand in hand with kind of understanding how is the product produced, what are the requirements, that is point two. Point three really is um, get to know the people. Um, we, we, we are all people, we are all humans, and we all really uh, want and need this, this human touch. Some of us admit it, others don't, but we really all have that desire kind of built in. Um, and if you just, you know, um, add somebody in China as plant manager who's, who's Chinese, and then you don't introduce him to the people in, it's, you know, it's not just about introducing, it's finding a way that this person can actually build up a genuine connection with the people in your headquarters. The people who will then be communicating with him, the people who will then sometimes be pestering him. Um, if there is no such connection, then uh, this is really kind of, it feels like, you know, writing emails to a stranger. What you really want to have is to, to have the thing where you can pick up the phone, you can call Jinjie in China and tell Jinjie, look, we need this, or look, Jinjie, we need to change that. You know, this is kind of what you're aiming for. Um, and this is where you need to think a little bit about how much time should this person be here? Um, how can we facilitate this kind of uh, team building and connection building? Um, and also, you know, always have your finger on the pulse and understand how far away are we? And also, you know, in, in uh, kind of in, uh, in last resort, be fair. And if after a long time you see that it's just not coming forth to accept this fact, and maybe start thinking about uh, a backup solution. Um, following up on that, there was a question that came in from Douglas who says, um, I am hiring a production manager and we are going to be offering this person training in the US. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible, because I've had experience already with lower level staff of visas being refused, so I guess the assumption is, Douglas, that the person you're hiring is Chinese. Um, you know, if you want someone to go to the U.S. or to U.K. or Europe for training, um, you know, is it easy to grant the visas for longer periods of time that they can actually obtain the trainings? Um, I'm, I'm not, Douglas, I'm, I'm not a visa specialist. I, I really don't know uh, currently. Um, so, with, uh, with, uh, with the current I'll, political situation, I'll, you, I'll, you I'll, add, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that a little bit. So, um, uh, Douglas, nobody can actually answer that question for you because ultimately the only um, people who will grant the visa will be the U.S. consulate in China. Um, and there is no lawyer, there is nobody that can currently uh, dictate uh, what the U.S. consulate is going to decide. I think, however, in managerial positions um, where you are requesting that um, the production manager go over to the U.S., if you provide sufficient documentation in, in the form of employment contract, in the form of what the training will entail in the U.S., if you provide an agenda um, of, of, of dates, cities, uh, specific uh, criteria, you know, what will this person be learning, you'll have a much better chance. I mean, obviously, the more documentation you can give, the more chance you will have that this person will be granted the visa. Um, you know, the biggest fear for any consulate, whether it's the U.S., the U.K., or whomever, is that this person then, um, at that point of being in the U.S., gets fired and doesn't return home, but actually then stays illegally within the country. So, you know, they're going to make it difficult. And just two more thoughts here, Douglas. Um, 
you know, you need to really be thinking about um, fluctuation is one thing. There is, uh, if I understand correctly, we're talking about production manager, not a plant manager. So this is a couple, uh, this is definitely lower. Um, you need to be thinking about, you know, how do I do it that when he kind of got the training that he doesn't quit the company? This is a thought to consider. And the other thing is really, you know, sometimes depending on what you already have in China, if you already have a running factory or in you know, the process of, you might also, um, you know, put it in, in, in smaller pieces. You maybe, if you, if you want to do three months overall, do three times one month, or if you want to do six weeks, do maybe two times three weeks, something like this. Um, yes, there are higher flight costs involved, um, but I, we found that quite often, you know, splitting it up in a couple of cases is, is, is quite good. That uh, is one thought, and the other thought is also, again, depending on the facilities progress in China, um, you know, just, just think about um, bringing in the technicians to China and teach over there, uh, and then you kind of can build a program where only the, the best people are actually allowed to go to the US because, uh, like it or not, uh, you also need to think about intellectual property rights here. Um, and once you bring in somebody into your headquarters facility, um, you'll, you'll need to think about what do I really want to show him, what happens if this person would leave me when, let's say, uh, in the next six or nine months. Um, so moving on, Douglas, I hope we, if you have any further questions, just let Manfred and I know. Um, moving on from that, um, Manfred, when a company is looking to hire a Westerner for the role of plant manager or, or any of these um, senior man managerial roles, um, most factories in China are not really in the tier one cities where, you know, you have a bit of fun, there are schools, there's a bit of livelihood. Most of them are actually in the tier two, tier three, tier four cities. So if you are looking to hire a Westerner, how do you attract people um, or persuade people or convince people to move out to these locations? What, what can you do? Do you have any tips for this? I'm Austrian, so we always offer chocolate cake. <laughs> um, no, I mean, in all fairness, um, yes, there are many, many cities out there that uh, you, you, you don't really want to spend time in. Um, so I think what really helps here is to come a little bit from, a, um, from a, a, an angle of, you know, which face in life is this person? So, for example, um, currently um, we are looking for a, a plant manager in Ningbo, uh, and one of the candidates, he is uh, mid 50s, he's single, and he's kind of been working all over China. Um, so, this is what I mean with life faces. You know, somebody who's 40, somebody whose kids are in, let's say, an international school in Nanjing, uh, and who's happily married. Um, you, you will simply have a different chance of success with, with, with a person in that kind of life phase. However, somebody who is uh, rather younger and who's kind of, you know, out for an adventure um, or somebody who is uh, kind of, you know, uh, only having a couple of years to, to retirement, these definitely are people from my current perspective um, where you've got higher chances of success. Um, the only thing you really need to make sure when you hire people like that is um, go in, in, in depth over their CV if they've been switching a lot and let them explain why they switch. Because there is a certain kind of Western in China that's kind of, you know, um, going from factory to factory and who's only spending, let's say, uh, 18 months to three years there. Um, I don't suggest hiring, you know, that kind of person unless it's really an, an, an interim role that you're recruiting for. So that leads me to a question um, from, from my side, Manfred. Generally, how long should a company expect to have the same person uh, in this type of role? Um, you know, because I always think it might be good to have some fresh blood, um, fresh experience, uh, especially when you are dealing with production. Because, you know, one thing you highlighted on a previous slide was all about fluctuations, what would be a good term of, of, of employment for these types of roles? I mean, if we're talking about the, the man who is in charge of a whole, of a whole plant with, let's say, 100 to, to 200 or 300 people, um, if we're talking SMEs here and if we're talking uh, 
owner of the company or also managers, they, they always want to have somebody in there for the long run. And long run there means from a central European perspective, definitely more than five years. Um, larger organizations, I think, are a little bit more flexible, but they also wouldn't mind to have somebody, let's say, five to ten years in that role. I, I can't really, or I don't want to generalize um, on, on companies' philosophies if, if it would be good to have a new uh, leader there for, for their production facility. That, I think, is a bit of a different discussion. Um, uh, what I can say is really, in China overall, um, the topic of fluctuation of people turnover is a big one. Um, I think you can handle it with, you know, um, a much higher degree of communication. I think you can handle it with, you know, strongly, strongly, strongly communicating to the candidates and to the people who are already in this position where you go, how you will get there, what it means for them, um, how important they are. These things are very, very, very important. Put differently, you need to build up a relationship with that person. It's not just the job. Um, get to know that person, get to know their, their, their feelings, their understanding, why they love your company or why they actually want to switch. Um, again, you know, we're, we're, we're all humans. Uh, we, we all got certain ideas and ambitions and feelings and needs. Um, try to understand people a little bit and then, you know, um, work it from there. <clears throat> I, I, I just want to put my, my two cents into that, that question in terms of the fluctuation, um, especially if the production site is in a remote area and we're talking about a Westerner. Um, for a lot of them, you know, five years w would be a minimum um, to really build up a production facility and actually see it running for a certain period of time. But I think also in order to help with the persuasion aspect and to limit the whole fluctuation thing is if you can kind of, uh, and I say this with, with colons, is, is um, if you can kind of promise them a position in a nicer location after that, <laughs> meaning, for example, in the headquarters or, you know, uh, moving to Shanghai to manage the, Shang you know, the, the whole China operation, if you give them something to look forward to, then actually those five years can run by so fast for them because they're so focused on building something up, but they also have the confidence knowing that that something is going to come after. Um, and, and, and again, it's, it's a whole psychological thing that happens that happens with people. Um, the mm. final the final question, because I do want to go on to a little bit of the monetary aspect, Manfred, is I've seen a lot of um, uh, companies not budget a appropriately for these types of roles, meaning they haven't taken into account the allowances. Um, what tips can you give to companies who need to start creating a budget? Um, you know, how, how should they consider the allowances? What type of allowances are provided? Um, what, what, should, what should they think about from that perspective? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do two things. I'll, 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 I'll say one big number. Um, and then I'll kind of uh, split it down a little bit. Um, in terms of allowances, really, if you're talking about an experienced Westerner who's living in China with a family and has having anything between, let's say, uh, one to three kids, um, allowances, we can be talking 50 to 100,000 euros. And also quite clearly, um, kids, international school uh, in a tier one or tier two city, um, this is going to be half of it. Yeah. So, so these are costs that are normally covered by the company. And uh, for those of you who just didn't have a heart attack, um, that, you know, that's, that's, that's just the way it is. Other offers out there will cover that. Um, if you're not happy with covering that, we need to be talking a different kind of uh, person kind of or different kind of experience profile. Huh? And apart from that, you know, you normally would be paying, um, you normally would be paying the flat. Uh, you normally would be paying international health assurance. Uh, you mm, most likely would be offering them a company car. Sometimes a company car is even with a driver. Um, and these, I would say, are the uh, kind of, so to speak, financially the biggest components uh, in the allowance segment that, that you put on top uh, of what this person is earning and on top of what his bonus is. Yeah, I would agree. People really weigh out that cost. 
um, and don't realize it. Um, I just, just as also a little bit of a tip, if you're looking to understand what school prices are like, um, whether it's in Shanghai or Wuhan, where, where you know there there are international schools, British schools, American schools, you can also reach out to those schools just to get their price listing. Be aware that every year prices do increase, um, and obviously mm. prices increase as the kids get older. Um, mm. So it, it's a huge part of, of, of the cost, actually, is the schooling. Um, Manfred, we are five minutes over. I don't want to keep people more, but I want to thank you very much for today's presentation. Um, it's been a pleasure. For everyone else, I hope, I hope Manfred was able to enlighten you on, on the whole production aspect and, and finding the right production manager. Um, we have one more webinar in this webinar series, which is on the individual income tax reform. Um, I will also be uh, putting a little bit of attention on visa applications uh, for Westerners as well as on social insurances. Um, so if you are interested in that, because this may help you in terms of formulating um, your salary packages for people, then please do register and join us for tomorrow's session. I would like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Manfred, again, thank you very much. Uh, Manfred will be with us tomorrow, and, and he'll also be the moderator for tomorrow's session. So for everyone else, have a lovely day, and we will see you again tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you so much. Goodbye.